Hey, hey, everybody. This is Jamie Beard. I'm executive director of the Geothermal Entrepreneurship Organization at the University of Texas at Austin. I am here to introduce Pivot 21's first fireside chat, and it's really, really exciting. So I'm going to introduce my friend, Bob Metcalf. He's going to run the session today. Bob is a friend, and he's also the principal investigator of my program at UT Austin Geo and has become a passionate geothermal advocate. He's a professor of innovation at UT Austin and also the founding director of the Texas Innovation Center. But Bob's claim to fame really in the world and his impact has been in the internet. He's an internet pioneer, the inventor of the ethernet in 1973, founder of 3Com in 1979, which merged with Hewlett Packard. Then he was CEO of IDG InfoWorld in the 1990s and a venture capitalist with Polaris Partners in the 2000s. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, a trustee emeritus at MIT. He received the IEEE Medal of Honor in 1996 and the National Medal of Technology in 2005. And I'm so excited to introduce him in. Hello, Bob. And Hello. I will see you all later. Have a good conversation with Dan Jurgen. And now I get to introduce Dan Jurgen, uh, and it's a high honor and a great pleasure. Uh, the New York Times has called uh, Dr. Jurgen America's most influential energy pundit. And the Fortune magazine has called him one of the planet's foremost thinkers about energy and its implications. He is vice chairman of IHS Market, a global information company. He's also a best-selling author. Uh, by the way, I have his books right here. They're ve they're, oh, they don't show well, I guess, but they're very heavy. And, uh, and uh, uh, he received the Pulitzer Prize for uh, his book called The Prize uh, in 1990. His new book, the one that, uh, one that I'm holding up here, uh, is called The New Map, and we're going to talk about The New Map. Uh, NPR calls it a master class on how the world works. And the, the, Sunday, the London Sunday Times said it's a wonderful book, and I agree. Now, I have to admit, uh, Dr. Jurgen, that I haven't read your book. What I did was I listened to it for 15 hours on my, as I walked around uh, here in Maine, and it's, uh, it's a wonderful book. You know, for an engineer like me who doesn't know how the world works, it was, uh, it was a revelation. Uh, and I'm hoping you're going to tell us uh, in a few seconds, you're going to start telling us about uh, the stories that you told in the new map. What is the new map that you have in mind? Well, thank you, uh, Bob. Very glad to be on with you and great respect for you as a great innovator. And uh, I think this program pivot is really quite amazing what it's accomplished in, in two years or so. Uh, the new map is saying that the, the map of energy and geopolitics has really changed quite dramatically over the last five or six years. It's changed in terms of uh, obviously the shale revolution, uh, Paris, uh, the climate agenda, uh, and very critically, US-Chinese relations. Those are some of the big changes that have happened. And, um, and it's a time of great innovation and in energy of which uh, geothermal is part of that. I noticed the word geothermal does not appear in your book, The New Map. Yes, I, I knew you were gonna, the word geopolitics appears a lot. Geothermal doesn't, we did a study in, uh, 2019 for Breakthrough Energy for Bill Gates Group. And at that point, did it with Ernie Moniz, a former uh, energy secretary. And we went through about 28 technologies, and you're quite right. We didn't have geothermal in there. And I think um, I'd written about it in previous books, but I think that um, I think what's happened in the last two years and what Pivot's trying to do is really putting geothermal uh, back on the map. So one thing your book does for me is it teaches how energy and geopolitics are entangled, are the same. They're not separate subjects. That is, you have lots of stories about how a sudden development like shale affected who was the head of which country and which country was hostile to one of the others and which one was suddenly running out of money. Could you, could you elaborate on that point about this entanglement? Yeah, I, I mean, I guess I, I didn't realize until I finished the book that I guess several of the books have been have been really on this theme of how energy and geopolitics works, going back to the prize. But uh, it was brought home to me, if, uh, just to tell one story, uh, every year Vladimir Putin has his conference in Moscow, in St. Petersburg, 
which is his version of the famous Davos conference. And uh, he was on the platform with uh, Angela Merkel, the chancellor of Germany. And I was told, ask the first question. And so the idea was I'd ask him a question about diversifying his economy so he wasn't so dependent on oil and gas. And by accident, I mentioned the word shale. And he started shouting at me. And I can tell you, Bob, being shouted at by Vladimir Putin in front of 3,000 people is not a pleasant experience. <laughs> and I realized that there was two reasons he didn't like it. Well, he didn't like shale. One, because the US had now become a competitor with Russian energy, US uh, exports of LNG. And two, he sees shale as an adjunct of uh, US foreign policy, uh, that it gives the US a new dimension of influence in the world, which is very vivid to me in my work uh, with the Indian government, how an important element that's become in that relationship. So that's just one example of how these things come together. So nothing bad happened to you after uh, Mr. Putin? No, uh, I, I put on sunglasses and a fake mustache <laughs> and left the hall, but I, I survived. Well, I didn't realize until I read, uh, listened to your book that the three top producers were the United States, Russia, and Saudi. Is that, that's right. Those are the top yeah, three. Yeah, that, that's right. I mean, people, you know, the U.S., if we went back, and I know there are a lot of oil and gas people on this, as, as well as people from other disciplines uh, and industries, but... If you go back to 2008, the U.S. was importing 60% of its oil. It was the world's largest importer of oil. And then comes along the shale revolution, which is a great case study for innovation in technology. And the U.S. now is actually the world's largest producer of oil, producing more oil than Saudi Arabia and more oil than Russia. So it really is the big three today. But that affects, uh, to overmake your point, that, that affects how we behave and how they behave, the fact that we're no longer uh, dependent on them for our oil. Is that right? Yeah. yeah as the shale revolution was happening, I, I remember when I'd be in the Middle East, uh, you know, people would say, don't, don't forget about us, uh, because, you know, it, it changes things that, um, and we can see it happening in terms of the withdrawal of the U.S. from the Middle East. I was in a meeting uh, two months ago with a prominent sort of Democrat, and he said, we have to right-size our commitment to the Middle East. Uh, and I realized he wouldn't be saying that if we were still importing 60% of our oil. So uh, it, um, it definitely has a, uh, an effect. And one of the striking developments that has happened in the last uh, five years is this kind of alliance between Russia and Saudi Arabia. And part of it is you know, just because of price and and how to deal with U.S. shale and oversupply. But I think also Saudi Arabia uh, sees it in its interest to have a relationship with, with Russia now as part of its own balancing strategy. And a more, a, a more uh, dramatic impact is uh, Iran. So jihad out of Iran was suddenly enabled by oil revenue in Iran. Well, exactly, um, uh, you know, Iranian oil revenues, it has enabled Iran, I mean, it's sort of faded from the front pages, but the Iranian militias are very active uh, across the Middle East. Uh, at least the Persian Gulf countries think it's to encircle them. Uh, but also, just another example to go to the impact of shale. Uh, you know, we did make this nuclear deal with Iran in 2015. Uh, and the way the U.S. achieved it was by putting sanctions that prevented the export of Iranian oil, among other things. And when those sanctions were put in place in 2012, the Iranians said they won't work because the world needs our oil. It turns out it didn't need its oil because the US production grew so much that Iran, Iranian oil almost became irrelevant to the world market. Was that a coincidence? No, it's, it's <laughs> not a coincidence. And it's interesting that you know President Obama, when he was in office, twice in State of the Union addresses, went out of his way to say, this shale revolution is a good thing for the United States. Indeed. Now, your book tells, is a long story. It goes way back. It goes back to like the first map that you introduced, which is this map of China, which was uh, 19th century or 18th century, I forget which. Well, it, there are a number of different maps. Uh, actually, I wanted to go back to the very first map that had ever been discovered. Uh, 
uh, in uh, Iraq by our archaeologists, but my publisher said that would lead people to think this was a book about physical maps. Uh, but the map that's really critical right now and is really central, one of the really central issues between the US and China, and everybody watching this should know that the biggest geopolitical story going on in the world today is a growing tension between China and the United States. And it probably by about 2028, China will have a larger economy than the United States. But the map I think you're talking about, Bob, is a map of what's called the nine dash line, nine dash line map of the South China Sea. And people may think the South China Sea is really far away, but it is actually the single most important body of water in economic terms in the world. One third of world trade passes through it. And uh, this is an amazing story that uh, in the early 1930s, when France and Vietnam was a French colony, the French decided they wanted to plant some flags on some small islands in the South China Sea. A word got back to Beijing, uh, to bait Peking as it was then. Uh, Chinese nationalism was inflamed. And a Chinese geographer drew a map of the nine dash line showing that all of the South China Sea, which is pretty big, belongs to China as Chinese territory. That map was adopted by the nationalists. And then when the communists took over China, they adopted it. And today, where do you find the most likely place where the US and China will have a military collision? The South China Sea, because China claims the South China Sea as its own. Uh, and the rest of the world does not regard it as that. And the US Navy is there for freedom of navigation. And there have been several instances of near collision between US and uh, Chinese naval ships. And of course, there is a, an, a, an energy connection to this geopolitical struggle. Well, as I recall, the, it, the energy connection isn't that there's oil in the South China Sea, it's that the oil has to pass through the South China Sea. Exactly. You'll often read that there's a treasure of oil under there, but at least our geologists and I think company geologists think there's, there's certainly oil and gas resources there, but it's not like it would be a home run. But what does count is China is now in the position that the United States was in 2008. It imports 75 percent of its oil. And lo and behold, most of that oil comes through the South China Sea. And the Chinese worry about the US Navy and the flow of that oil if there is some kind of hostilities. Mm -hmm. So that, that's uh, we've just touched on one of the maps in, in your story. As we move toward the toward the end of your book, there's there's the plague. So there's a uh, the, the coronavirus hits and that affects the oil market and the oil market is affected. Well, a, a collapse of demand, as I recall. Yes, that is almost that's uh, real time. You know, here we are, uh, you know, probably m majority of people on this uh, video have gotten their vaccinations uh, last uh, in April of uh, last year. It was a very different picture. And um, uh, there, just around that time, uh, there was a struggle between Saudi Arabia and Russia about how much oil to put into the global market. Uh, but what happened, of course, uh, in a way that just was not anticipated, you know, really no one saw that the world economy would just shut down and uh, world oil demand plummeted in a way it had never plummeted before. Oil prices uh, collapsed. And um, in fact, oil prices went negative, which people had a hard time scratching their heads. But the idea is you had to pay somebody with so much oil that couldn't find its way to market. And uh, that looked like the oil and gas industry, the days were going to be numbered. And then, Bob, before you talked about the big three and uh, the heavyweight in the big three, uh, then President Donald Trump, realizing that you know, the shale industry could be wiped out in the United States and what that would mean. Uh, and pressed by a number of senators from energy states, uh, started a process of negotiation, and he made a deal. He prompted a deal that brought the Saudis and the Russians together and led to uh, a cutback in oil production of something like nine points, an agreement to bring production down 9.7 million barrels a day. And that started to rescue the price of oil to the 20 or $30 range. And today, what are we? 15 months later, it's, it's, it's around $70 a barrel. But it was uh, the coronavirus, uh, uh, you know, 
that's just a sign of the economic impact of that. Uh, of that a deal virus. sounds uh, sounds like an impromptu OPEC. The th three big suppliers agree to limit production. Well, it it was. I mean, the U.S. had to be a little careful because of, you know, talk about stabilization and. You had other producers. India has become very important. India wanted stabilization. But that really reinforced this thing. You know, we talk about OPEC, but it's now OPEC plus because it's it's the OPEC countries led by Saudi Arabia, along with uh, these other oil exporters led by Russia. And at the heart of it is a, uh, a Russian Saudi or Saudi Russian mechanism for managing a, a global market. Although uh, over the last two weeks, we saw it look like bit that it was going to break down again. But uh, on Sunday, they made a deal that uh, will bring more oil back. And in general, uh, the world economy has come back much more strongly than people had expected. We show in our work that world economic growth this year will be 6%. The world economy now is bigger than it was in 2019. And that means that the demand for oil has come back more more rapidly and uh, any people international air travel hasn't come back of course but if you go into an american airport you can see how crowded it is and people are in their cars and are are driving again and so uh, right now it needs more oil although with the concerns about the delta variant you know you start to see a little shakiness again in the economic outlook yeah, 500 point drop, or was it 900 point drop, I guess, the last couple of days? Yeah. Which is bouncing back. Now, you, the next demand shortage you've projected, it's toward the end of your book, you're, the map moves to uh, electronics and the robots and the self driving cars. And the uh, this looks like another reduction of demand for oil and gas. Will it, I mean, will it have that kind of impact? Well, I, I, I think so. I mean, you have General Motors saying uh, we're not going to produce any gasoline cars after uh, 2035. And uh, that breaks a pretty strong string. The first uh, GM car that ran on the streets of Detroit was in, 2000, in, in 1911. So 2035, uh, they, no more electric cars, no more gasoline cars. Uh, and I talk in the book about, you know, how how the whole framework, what I call um, uh, uh, auto tech comes together. It brings, Bob, part of the world that you had such an impact on. It brings technology together with automobiles in which you have electric cars, you have uh, ride hailing, you have self-driving cars. You know, maybe at least one, one, spec one scenario is that, you, that, that in urban areas, people won't really own cars, they'll be companies uh, that operate large fleets of self-driving cars, say in 20 years. So demand for gasoline will go down in, and will go down. So, but on the other hand, cars in the United States stay on the road for 12 years. So we're gonna, the world will still be using, I think a lot of oil by uh, 2050. But I think, I think where you, what you were going to was, you know, kind of the energy transition technologies and their impact, and that, and uh, if I could pick up on on that part, um, you know, people talk about big oil today, and I suspect in ten years people will be talking about big shovels, because in order to go to a um, kind of uh, net zero target, means a lot more wind, a lot more solar, and that means a lot more. Uh, minerals, a lot more mining. I think it's for a thousand pound EV battery in an electric car, you have to move 500,000 uh, pounds of earth. So a huge amount of mining that will take place and new supply chains. And you're just seeing in the last month or two, a waking up to the fact, well, whoa, where's all that stuff gonna come from? And oh, by the way, China dominates most of these supply chains. Uh, and that was clear in uh, a, a uh, executive order and, uh, and a report that the White House just recently put out. So even if we move into a different energy realm, uh, geopolitics, it'll just be a different geopolitics that will be involved in it.
Yeah, I want to go back to your uh, a key point. I'm, I'm a very impatient person, and I want everything to happen over the weekend. But you introduced this notion of the fleet, the fleet of cars, the fleet of ships, the fleet of oil wells, and how fleets are a big flywheel in the system. So when you, when you say something's going to happen, you're talking about 20, 30, 40 years from now because it takes that long for the fleet to turn over. I, what, in fact, you just mentioned the number. The average car lasts 12 years. Each year, 6% of the fleet is replaced. So therefore, these things we've just been talking about take time. They take a very a much longer time than than makes me happy. So the, uh, and, and on the mining point, have you run into the idea of using geothermal wells as mines that is bringing these uh, like lithium to the surface uh, with the brines in the wells? I have not, but it sounds like uh, we should put that on the list. Yeah, let's put uh, that Bob, on. Let me turn around and ask you a question. I mean, I'm struck like the shale revolution took about 18, no, it took uh, almost 20 years to really get going. You've been involved in innovation, you know, your whole professional life. What do you say? I mean, do you have a model in your head about the time frame for innovations to really take off? Well, the internet just turned 50. So there's, of course, it depends on what you declare the beginning of the internet. And uh, this is a little definitional problem. In fact, we argue about it. The various inventors of the internet over its various stages argue about when the internet started. But the general agreement <laughs> is October 29th, 1969 was the uh, first packet switching system the ARPANET, of the ARPANET. So that so the internet's 50 years old, to go to your question about the time. So at no time during that 50 years that I think it would take 50 years. I always thought it was like next year, suddenly it was, everyone was going to have a personal computer, and right after that they were going to have a spreadsheet. But, <laughs> but then it, it spreads itself over time. Uh, there's the fleet effect. Um, but then there's other effects. So, in fact, one of the things that worries me about geothermal is uh, the geopolitics of it. If I owned, if I were Saudi Arabia and I owned all that oil in the ground, geothermal would not be good news for me, right? That would devalue my uh, oil reserves. So suddenly I've added to my list of obstacles to the adoption of geothermal is the is uh, Saudi Arabia's protection of its oil reserves. Is that a... Well, I think, I don't think I would see it quite that way, because of course, geothermal, I mean, it would mainly be used for electricity uh, and for heating, of course. So as opposed to transportation, unless all the cars were electric. But, so, you, but they are going to be electric. Well, that's what, we, that's what we're told, exactly. And they're going to have lithium batteries from the lithium mined by the geothermal wells. Right. Well, you, you see it all happening. I mean, what is interesting about, uh, to me, about Pivot is that there are two things it's doing to maybe accelerate the, the geothermal. One is uh, this notion of identifying a lot of, uh, and helping to get started, a lot of uh, basically venture capital entrepreneurial companies who will try different things to try and make it find the right way to do it or multiple ways to do it. And secondly, uh, very different from a lot of the other dialogues saying, wait, we can build upon the skill set of the um, oil and gas industry. And by the way, in particular, uh, the shale revolution perhaps also provides a pathway to, uh, to uh, enhance geothermal. Well, you and Jamie agree the startup strategy and the partner up with oil and gas, or the pivot strategy, are the two mainstays of her uh, uh, her leading our project, University of Texas. Create a startup ecosystem and have it, instead of treating the oil and gas industry as the enemy, is to treat the oil and gas industry as partners in an energy transition. And, and it's, you know, it's, I think in an energy transition, you need companies that, uh, know, you know, that are skilled at engineering, uh, that can do scale and that know how to execute projects That's kind of describes the oil and gas industry. And they drill tens of thousands of wells per year, whereas the historical geothermal industry, you know, there's a press release 
every month of a well that maybe got started somewhere. That there's no scale yet, and that's right. uh, our plan is to get to scale this decade, the geothermal decade. So I so thought I thought Bob, you were thinking next year. <laughs> well, I'm getting trying to get more realistic. So let's talk about geothermal and geopolitics. And I think the relationship goes both ways. That is, ge geopolitics can affect the evolution of geothermal and vice versa. And I'm wondering how geothermal, no, I'm sorry, how geopolitics under the fossil fuel regime is different from geopolitics under the geothermal regime. Well, I think even you would admit that the geothermal regime is not something that's going to you know, maybe we'll start to see it getting to real scale by the end of this decade, which is now not so far away. Um, but, you know, if, um, if, you know, if, if, I mean, it basically goes back to people having choices and alternatives. And if uh, you have a system where geothermal, as you're suggesting, and as Jamie is, is uh, foreseeing, gets to scale, then you've really, um, you've changed a lot of things in terms of the, um, how the energy system works uh, and how the geopolitics works. And, um, you know, it will, the question will be, I think the demand for oil will be here for quite a long time. By the way, 20% of an electric car is plastics. Uh, and uh, I think even in 2050, the world will be using a lot of oil and gas, not as much as it is using today. The carbon capture will be a very important uh, part of the, the picture, but um, it would change uh, geopolitics. It would uh, particularly because if it meant that it was really a, a domestic business, and it 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 sort of would in a sense take you out of geopolitics. It would take energy uh, and energy supply and energy security uh, kind of off the table. In the, right, with geoth in a geothermal regime, you don't have ships going through the South China Sea. No, yeah, uh, but I think um, you all are, you know, and I think a lot of the reason so many people are on this conference this week is a sense that uh, this could be an important element. There are other elements out there too. You know, if you if you go to Europe right now, well, first of all, you'd have to get countries willing to allow drilling to go on. And we've seen, for instance, in Europe, uh, a lot of reluctance. Uh, but um, the Europeans right now are talking about having 25% of their energy economy by 2050 be hydrogen. There too, you're kind of starting from um, the one yard line to get there. So I think all of these technologies really unfold, you say a decade, probably two decades, but if you have, uh, as we've seen, as we saw with shale, if you start to see uh, successful projects, then you get a pretty rapid migration to other people uh, doing it. Yeah, so what will it, so my unrealistic notion is that we're gonna get to scale this decade. I, th I think J uh, Jamie and I promised the Department of Energy it would be within 10 years. And I have to remind Jamie it's, it's nine years now because <laughs> a year has passed. Uh, uh, but when you say scale, what do you have in, what do you guys have in mind? Or, uh, or is, that, is that too fuzzy? A, is it well, it, it, the notion of scale relies on uh, partnering with oil and gas. Oil and ass, gas has the scale. It has people right. who know how to drill. It has rigs. Some of those rigs are parked in parking lots, not drilling anything right now. So the way to get to the, the essential way to get to scale is to shift a bunch of oil and gas assets, people, uh, companies, know-how, technology, rigs, shift it over so that we're drilling geothermal wells, you know, one a day, not one a year. Right. Um, I think, and obviously, the reason for the, you know, as you said, as you as well as Jamie sees it is. You know, embrace bring in the oil and gas industry, and certainly the oil and gas industry is under increasing pressure of uh, from investors and from regulation and regulatory pressures uh, to uh, define how do you how do you reduce carbon, how do you uh, uh, 
pivot towards uh, lower carbon or net zero carbon, as some companies have said by 2050. The thing is that, um, you know, the what is there, as I say in, uh, in the new map, the how you get there is not at all clear. And the answers are, at the end of the day, I think not going to be regulation. There's certainly not going to be rhetoric. Uh, they're going to be technology and innovation is, is, is what will be required. And this, I think, uh, I think with, with Pivot, I think what you've really done is opened a whole new door that really was closed or just people didn't see the door. So to oversimplify the door, I think the reason uh, geothermal hasn't taken off sooner is because of the cost of drilling. And if we have new technologies that can reduce the cost of drilling by a factor of 10 or or a factor of 20, uh, then the, uh, a lot, there'll be a lot of simplification because you won't need a lot of regulation. People will choose to use geothermal energy because it's right. cheap and clean. Not right. just clean, cheap and clean. Right, but it, obviously today it's not cheap. And so it is like any, you know, the issue is bring down the cost. And um, we've seen again and again that the oil and gas industry is very good at bringing down costs. When people think, oh, you know, I think in 2014, when the oil price collapsed, the OPEC countries thought that it would kind of many of them thought it would wipe out shale because they thought it required $70 a barrel. Well, it turned out people brought down costs and uh, that continual focus will be there. So here it's, is, you know, is the challenge as you said a tenfold reduction in costs so which which benefit of geothermal do you think is uh, most impactful cost or a base load or clean um, that's a very interesting question i think uh, i think low you know i guess really net zero carbon i think the benefits would be for base load generation and for heating. I mean, one of the big challenges uh, now in the net zero carbon drive, let's put it that way, is, you know, you can, okay, you can have electric cars. Uh, although, by the way, you'll use a lot of carbon because you have to mine things and ship them across waters. But, um, but how do you, um, how, but, to decarbonize industry, which requires a lot of heat, is, uh, is, is really cited as the biggest, maybe one of the biggest challenges. And if you have this source of heat, that would be very, you know, very significant. On uh, that scale again. I was born so, in I don't, we, we don't know, of course, I, I don't know the degree, and I imagine some of the panels are addressing it, what will be the regulatory environment, um, you know, which age, which agencies will regulate this and regulate it at a state level or a federal level, but that's still down the road. And can we sustain what's called, I think I just learned this, uh, social license? Social license to operate, yes. It is something that preoccupies uh, the oil and gas industry. And uh, if, to continue the metaphor, uh, the license fees have a habit of going up. Uh, right. Yeah, but it's clean. Can't we just say it's clean and doesn't that give us social license or do we? Well, have... I think you'll, you know, you know, Bob, that people will raise questions about seismicity. Um, you know, this is, at least in Western Europe and the United States, it's very hard to do new things. It's very hard to get things permitted. I mean, we would not have been able in, uh, in 2021 to get permits for the interstate highway system. Or another way to put it, if we had the system in place that we have today in 1956, uh, they would still be trying to get permits for the, for the interstate highway system in 2021. I mean, there are some, there's, I mean, there's some real problems and the regulatory pressures are gonna, you know, over the next couple of years with this administration, where, whatever you, whether you like them or don't like them, they're gonna be much more interventionist in terms of regulation on energy and really, you know, across the economy, because that's their predilection. 
Yeah, the worst thing that could happen is they could roll out Jane Fonda to make a new movie about a geothermal earthquake, and that would be, that would be don't the end. Don't even mention that. <laughs> forget, forget I mentioned. Don't don't make anybody think that would be a good idea. <laughs> Well, do you have any uh, uh, parting advice for us, uh, us geothermophiles, and how we should go about uh, innovating uh, geothermal into the geopolitical context? Well, I, you know, I really like your formulation of, uh, you know, it really ties into the new map of uh, geothermal and geopolitics and uh, how they would fit together and how one would change the other. Um, I think that, you know, the, I think this kind of event is absolutely uh, critical. And then what, of course, is, is the demonstration projects to be able to do them. And um, at least in life, I know writing a book is usually is three times as hard as you think it will be when you start, which was the case with the new map. I think in many you know, new ventures, things are three times as hard as you think they'll be. So I think one quality is that will be very important is perseverance and and commitment and being able to stay the course and that depends upon you know the su financial support and people believing in what they're trying to do so let me end by recommending your book so i don't know if it shows at all on, it on the sort video. of shows it sort of shows. the new map by dr daniel jurgen and uh by and, the way, and, 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 and and my Bob, I did send you the copy so you could because I know you listened to it, but I wanted you to be sure to look at the pictures. This is the only book on energy and geopolitics that has a picture of the actor Jackie Chan in it. I'm very proud of that. So I, I have this I have a, this book has a lot of good stories in it that, uh, you know, people. But I think it's really I really try to create a framework for people who are working on what we would call the future of energy. Well, your book helped improve my health because I was listening to it while walking. So when I wanted to listen to more, I had to go walking. So I did more walking uh, during that week than ever. That would before. be great on the back of the paperback edition. This book is good for your health. <laughs> okay. Well, with that, uh, thank you very much for your time today and joining us in this, in this pivot of the oil and gas industry to geothermal energy. Thank so, you very much. Thank you, Bob. And Congratulations to Jamie and all of you who put on this conference and uh, very glad to be able to contribute and look forward to um, geothermal becoming a positive for geopolitics. So thank you for the invitation today. We'll see you at Pivot next year. Thank I you. Hope.